So, the election's over. Breathe a sigh of relief, some of us, and maybe others not so much. But one thing we learned is democracy continues to work. There's a peaceful transition that is happening. <coughs> the, uh, of course, peaceful, that's kind of tongue in cheek because there hasn't been a lot of peace necessarily in some of our cities across the country. Uh, but in this process, since they announced the candidates to the election, has brought us all kinds of difficulties, hacked emails, and leaked information, and name calling, and, and chants like build the wall. And you know, the reality of the situation after this election is half of the country is breathing a sigh of relief. The other half believes that the whole process has been yanked right out from under them. And they believe that we're on the edge of the apocalypse. Of course, we have a super moon tomorrow, right? So some of the things that are happening around the country don't necessarily uh, dissuade us from thinking that it might be the edge of the apocalypse. I just pray that we don't have to build a wall so we can hide behind in our shame for the way this process is going down. And I realize many of you are hurting. So, boy, the scriptures don't disappoint sometimes. And we have this little apocalypse from Luke's gospel. We could ask that question, was Jesus foretelling the future for his disciples or was he talking about us? But all is not doom and gloom. Jesus as soon as he lays out this gloomy future, he then says, you know what, stay the course and don't be afraid. In essence, he didn't say that, but that's what he's saying. He's telling all of us to trust and have faith, even when it seems like everything is going to hell in a handbag. So how could Jesus be so pessimistic and then optimistic in the same text? You know, some of you sitting here this morning are feeling okay about the election, probably just so, because it's over, and some of you not so much. This is what makes our country what it is, great or not. Whether you think we're on the right course, whether you think we're going to hell in a handbasket, people were free to go to polls, to select their candidate in thousands upon thousands, of polling stations across the United States, states, little churches, restaurants, funeral homes. Did you see the polling place in Lancaster that's at a funeral home? Channel 21 had a story, right? Full service. If the election stressed you out, you died, there you go. Right? You got a casket right there. Not all the polling stations are full service. But I'm feeling that many, many Americans feel as if some part of them has died in this election. No one can come out of this feeling unchanged. And if you did come out of this feeling unchanged, I give you a lot of credit. You know, a lot of people lost in this election. Pollsters? Who's ever going to believe a poll ever again, right? Not that we should have been in the first place, but... Uh, the Clintons, they may never recover. The GOP, even though their candidate won, the party imploded before, before they even elected. I mean, they, they lost their soul. They lost their center. I'm afraid the Democrats probably feel the same way. Glass ceilings all over the country lost in this election. I want to share two voices that I heard in the week leading up to the election. The one was a man who was voting for Trump, he said, and I quote, I hope Trump can bring our community a bowling alley or a movie theater so that our kids have something to do instead of running the streets. Now, there's a lot that's wrong in that statement. I've been to a bowling alley lately. It's, they, they aren't packed with kids staying out of trouble. And I haven't been to the movies lately because I can't afford it. 
but it's not the government's responsibility to entertain our youth. Amen? Amen. You know, that's why we have parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and churches and volunteers and organizations that work together to influence our youth. The next voice was the woman who was voting for Clinton. She said, if Hillary wins, I will finally know that I can achieve anything as a woman in this country. Unfortunately, I'm not a woman. So I may not know the depth of her sorrow, but I know as a person that I shouldn't chain myself or my hopes to another person and their success or their failure. All people are flawed. And she needs to hear the words of Jesus again in Matthew 19, 26. Let me tell you what they are if you forget. With humanity, this is impossible, Jesus says, but with God, all things are possible. We should chain ourselves to God, not people. And those are just two voices out of the millions and millions of people who believe that either hope has been ripped right out from their grasp or right out from underneath them, and those who believe that hope has finally come to their doorstep, but they've all staked their hopes upon the temporary, not the permanent. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and those gathered around him one day, they're at the temple, and the temple of Jerusalem, Jesus is telling them, is a temporary vessel set aside for God. It was a symbol. It was a temporary one at that. It was just waiting for the day that it might crumble from an earthquake or be destroyed by evil or a fire, or destruction, something to knock it down, to burn it to the ground. Jesus knew the disciples were in awe of its splendor. So he reminded them very quickly that all things on this earth are temporary. What is eternal is God. We need to be careful what or who we place our trust in. Whether it's something temporary or we place our trust in the eternal. So the issue for Jesus then and his disciples is the same issue for us today. How do we keep on believing in a God that's all powerful, this all sovereign, this all mighty, this all knowing, all loving, all gracious God who is all present when it feels like we're going to hell in a handbag. This election, this soul-sucking election is over. So what do we do? What does it all mean? If you've learned nothing about me in the last five years, hopefully you've learned that I am an observer and I listen. And I've heard people say a lot of things and I've read a lot of things post-election. I've heard things like this election opens up the possibility for hate speech to be acceptable, and we've seen those images from York and around the country, children doing stupid things. I've heard people say this election shows that America wasn't ready for a black president or for a woman to be president. Personally, I don't know what this election is telling us yet. But I do think we need to step back and to take a deep breath and return to God with prayer and presence. And as again, I think the scriptures really come through for us today. The prophet Malachi says, the day is coming when all the arrogance and all the evildoers will be stubble. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You see, the prophet Malachi was preaching to people of faith. He was speaking to the Israelites. And there were those among them who were saying things like, God no longer is with us. And why should we keep the faith when the arrogant continue to prosper? Malachi reminds them, one day, the day will come when God will act. He is reminding them they need to stay the course with their faith. 
when it seems as if all hell is breaking out around them. He was reminding them not to sell their soul, not to rely on just their own understanding. In these days following the election, I keep returning to my favorite verse from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. As people of faith, we are called to trust the Lord, that God is in all things, and that God will reveal God's will in God's time, as God chooses. <coughs> we will not always see with the clarity that we would hope. The Lord has this drone height view of everything, can see further and deeper and wider and with more depth than we will ever. We just need to see past all of the hyperbole that has and will continue to be spewed by those in power. This is my opinion, my opinion now, but to, to live on the promises of people, especially politicians, is like planting roses in a minefield. It may smell nice, but there's a chance it will blow up in your face. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? One thing I know is we need to allow God to be God and to trust that God will guide us through all of these next days and weeks and months to come. We cannot give up on God. Did you hear me? We cannot give up on God. I find it amazing that there are people who are willing to abandon God and the church when they feel as if they've endured something that they believe is just too much to handle. Jesus says when we put our trust in the temporary, we are going to be disappointed time and time again. Everything that is not of God, everything that does not involve the divine will fail you, will fail me, and one day it will be lost to time. This election, one day, will be lost to time. Just like the 2000 election with George Bush and Al Gore, the last time the person who won the popular vote didn't win the Electoral College. Just like Richard Nixon in 1974, this too will be gone and mostly forgotten. The days are surely coming, says the Lord. Magnificent buildings will be gone. Flawed leaders will be gone. Flawed elections will be gone. But what will not be gone is how we respond. Right now. Jesus is saying to us through the scriptures, do not fear. Do not panic. Do not withdraw. Do not flee. Wait patiently persist in doing good. Stick to your convictions of your faith. One day, or one way that we endure difficult times is to get out among people and continue to do the good that we are called to do. We can't let anyone or anything get us off that course. The days are surely coming says the Lord, when all things will be brought to completion by God. And we have no idea when that day will be. And yet tomorrow, people will still be hungry. Tomorrow, people will still be in need. Tomorrow, people will still be hurting. Tomorrow, people will still need to hear about Jesus. Neither candidate, whether it would be Trump or Clinton, would be able to do the work that this country needs by themselves. The help that people need cannot be given by just the government alone. Churches, the people of faith, need to be the hands and the feet of Christ. I was not convinced throughout this election that neither candidate really believed or believed much in their need for God. That's just my opinion. I believe most political leaders are too arrogant to think they need the guidance of the divine. But that's where you and I come in, to the picture. The first thing you and I need to do is to pray. Bible study Wednesday night, I gave out a 
five-step prayer plan that we should be engaged in from this moment forward. And if you'd like a copy of that, I have copies for you. People of God, Jesus places before you and me a real challenge. Challenge to see beyond the current and the immediate problems, the troubles of the superficial around us to see and to continue our relationship with God. To maintain our ministries to the people in our community. Now I'm going to quote Ann Landers. Don't think less of me. <laughs> There's a quote out there that's been attributed to Gandhi. <clears throat> Gandhi didn't say it. Ann Landers did. She said, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in something bigger than yourself. Let me say it again. To find, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in something bigger than yourself. That's the message of the gospel. If you truly want to survive the next four days, let alone the next four years, get active. Get involved in being the hands and feet of Christ. Not just to distract yourself, but to find your true self. Find the you that God created you to be. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let's sing. We need some joy in our lives, right? <laughs>